the leading risk factor for heart attacks, heart disease, and stroke. I'm talking about high cholesterol. According to Statistics Canada, nearly 40% of Canadians have unhealthy total cholesterol levels, and those numbers jump when you look at older adults. This affects 57% of 40 to 59-year-olds and 44% of those aged 60 to 79. You've probably heard that there are two kinds of cholesterol, the bad kind, LDL, and the good kind, HDL. What's the difference? We're going to unpack it all with our panel of experts. The good news is high cholesterol is a risk factor you can control with diet, exercise, and with medication. And we have the right people here to help with that. So first, Dr. Milan Gupta is a cardiologist and an associate professor of medicine. Durhan Wong Rieger is a patient advocate, president and CEO of the Institute for Optimizing Health Outcomes. Dr. Judith Glennie is a consultant and the president of JL Glennie Consulting. And Jennifer Saigo is a dietitian. So first, let's go around the table, and if you can each tell us about your area of expertise. Sure. Um, I'm a cardiologist. Uh, <clears throat> I practice uh, in Brampton, my clinical practice, and I'm a general cardiologist. But my uh, research interest for about 20 years now has been in the prevention of heart disease, and a large part of that focuses on cholesterol. Uh, so I uh, have been working with various uh, cholesterol medications uh, for a couple of decades uh, and am involved uh, with a group of experts across the country in writing the guidelines for physicians around when to use medication to treat high cholesterol. Okay, Durhan? So I'm a psychologist by training, but I've been a full-time patient advocate actually for about the last 20 years. Um, I head up the Institute for Optimizing Health Outcomes, and one of the things we do is actually help support and train patients in terms of how to manage their own health, but also we work with health professionals on how they can better coach patients. Uh, just very quickly, about uh, a couple of years ago, we started um, the what is now called the Canadian Heart Patient Alliance, really trying to bring together patients who are, in fact, at high risk for heart disease. And primarily, one of my motivating factors, of course, is I have a husband who actually has cardiovascular disease, has a genetic predisposition to high cholesterol, which is called familial hypercholesterolemia. And it's something that, as we get into the discussion, maybe we'll talk a little bit about more in terms of how do we help patients or individuals who may actually have that risk, um, but in fact, uh, do not or aren't aware of it. Okay, Dr. Glenny. Thanks, Louis. My, I'm Judy Glenny. I'm a pharmacist by training, um, mm -hmm. working in both hospital and community pharmacies uh, for many years. Ended up in government with Health Canada, so it, the regulator that decides what drugs come onto the Canadian market, and then eventually uh, joined the Ontario Ministry of Health in their drug programs branch, which is the uh, biggest drug program or government drug program for, for patients in the country. And uh, most recently with a pharmaceutical company and now back out consulting and working with pharmaceutical companies to help them understand what they need to do to get governments to fund the medications that they want to bring to Canada. Okay, and Jennifer Saigo. Sure, so I'm a registered dietitian and I practice uh, downtown Toronto at a place called Cle Cleveland Clinic Canada. Uh, we focus on preventative medicine, and so we see patients for um, annual screening physicals, executive health physicals, but also we focus on preventative medicine programs that help people who do have risk factors for disease to be able to modify those factors and ultimately, hopefully, live longer, healthier, more vital uh, li lives and lifestyles. And I've been there for about 10 years now, and so we've worked with an awful lot of people, helping them with issues related to weight management, cholesterol, exercise programs, and so on. Yeah, a lot of people have trouble with that. Uh, okay, so first of all, let's start from the beginning. What exactly is cholesterol, and what's the difference between the good stuff and the bad stuff? You're looking at me. I'm looking <laughs> at you. You're all right. the cardiologist. Uh, well, cholesterol is basically fat. Um, <clears throat> I think it's very important for everyone to realize that our bodies make cholesterol, primarily in our liver, and every cell in the body needs cholesterol. So we have a biologic need for cholesterol. And the majority of the cholesterol in your bloodstream, when you get a blood test done, it actually gets there not through what you eat, but by how much cholesterol your body makes. And the minority gets there through your diet. 
Uh, good cholesterol, or HDL, and the easy way to remember that is it's HDL, you want it to be high. H for high, H for good. And low is you want it to be bad, L for LDL. Uh, you want it to be low. So um, we used to think HDL was very important. We have been revising that concept in recent years. There's no doubt that if you are born with a high HDL, or you achieve a high HDL in life without the use of any medication, your risk for heart attack is lowered. So it's, it's a good thing to have a lot of HDL if you're lucky enough to have it. However, HDL isn't really modified through diet. You can change it a little bit, but not a lot. LDL is, uh, is the bread and butter of cardiology. Okay? That's the bad stuff. And LDL cholesterol is the cholesterol that basically enters the wall of the arteries in your heart, the arteries going to your brain, the arteries supplying your legs. And if LDL gets into the wall of the artery, that's what initiates the beginning of a process called atherosclerosis, which is plaque buildup or hardening of the arteries. And if that progresses, that can lead to heart attack, to stroke, and potentially to death. Okay, so why are older people disproportionately affected by this? <clears throat> Uh, again, that might be another one for Dr. Gupta, but I think uh, aging. I mean, it's it's a lifelong uh, um, evolution of being exposed to um, dietary sources, but as well just uh, the, the normal aging process. Did you want to add yeah, to that? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, basically, it's just that the older you are, the longer you've had bad habits, <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The longer you've, you know, had perhaps not the greatest diet and the longer you've had not to exercise and to gain weight, and we know that all of these things contribute to a higher bad cholesterol or LDL level. But in fact, if you get uh, even older, okay, uh, I won't say very old, okay, but um, the older we get beyond a certain age, in fact, cholesterol levels start going down because of changes in weight. We begin to lose weight when we get particularly aged uh, and changes in diet. Uh, at that age. I, actually, that kind of anticipates a question that I have, because uh, I was looking at some of the statistics, and I thought one of them was curious. And it said that in terms of the bad cholesterol, LDL, it affects 40% of 40 to 59-year-olds, 59 59 year olds, but that goes down to 26% for 60 to 79-year-olds. Year and if you look at the other larger number for people with total bad cholesterol, I was wondering, does that mean that older people have a hard time maintaining the good kind? Or what does that mean? Um, I don't want to dominate the conversation. No, 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 but, uh, <laughs> so HDL generally stays fairly constant because it's not as modifiable by lifestyle. LDL is very modifiable by lifestyle. But again, as you get particularly elderly, HDL levels begin to fall. One of the issues around why high cholesterol rates are lower in the elderly also is what we call survivor bias. Right? So if you have a very high LDL cholesterol, you're not as likely to make it to 70 or 80 years of age because you might die earlier of a heart attack or stroke. Yeah, I'm sorry, 60 yeah. is not, I'm not elderly. I'm not calling 60 elderly. <laughs> 60 to 79, here right. in this room, 70 is not elderly either. <laughs> right, but that, but that is a factor, absolutely, with all diseases, right? If rates go down with age, yeah. often there is a survivor bias incorporated into that. So if I just add about, um, you know, one of the issues for us that's really important, especially in terms of what we're doing with patient education, is trying to ask, uh, have people understand kind of what might be some of the familial risks in terms of high cholesterol, because high cholesterol does run in families, and we hear people say that. What people may not recognize is that in many cases, it's a genetic predisposition, <clears throat> and it's a gene that's actually carried on. So I think very much as Dr. Gupta says, if you have, in fact, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia is what we call it, so it's a family predisposition to high cholesterol, 
And when we talk to people and we talk to families about you know, getting screened and tested for it, we oftentimes hear people who have very high levels of cholesterol who may have suffered a stroke or other kinds of a cardiovascular event who will say, oh yeah, my father or my aunt or my grandfather, they will know that there's a family history to it. But nobody's actually really said to them, it is because you have a genetic predisposition to it. And quite frankly, the reason to actually get tested and screened to see if you do have is for your children. Because in many cases, if you have children that actually have a genetic predisposition to it, some of them may actually begin to develop high cholesterol as children. They may, in fact, for people who have FH, may suffer their first cardiovascular event before they're 30. Anytime I hear about a patient who's had a cardiovascular event before 30, I say, that's got to be FH. And when you probe into it, it's very much the case. So it is, you're right. So by 50, many of these you know, patients will have, in fact, had a, a, even a fatal heart event, especially women. So it is very important to know that if you've got a family history of it, you might want to get screened. You might want to get screened not just for yourself, because you may need to take extraordinary efforts, but also for, for the rest of the family. The only thing I would add on is is we have to remember that, you know that that history that you're talking about with multiple family members. I mean, our 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 science is just catching up with that description of that kind of a scenario, it, both in terms of understanding that that's a genetic um, disease and that can, and and then being able to identify it proactively, and now moving to the point where we have some treatments that uh, may be more helpful than what we've had in the past. Any idea of what percentage of the population it might affect? Well, Dr. Gupta probably knows better than I do. It, it varies, right? It used to be the thinking was like one in maybe 5,000. Yeah. One, no, one in 500. One in 500. Sorry, yeah, one in yeah. 500. That's now we think in, but if you're a certain ethnic uh, uh, composition, so for instance, if you're French, it might be one in 300. Um, and the challenge is that, um, <clears throat> As Judith said, now that we're getting to genetic testing, we're actually identifying more people who would not have been identified before. And you don't even actually have to do genetic testing to be able to identify it, but you, you know, we do have it to be able to very accurately identify it. So it's like anything else. Once you start to probe for it, and once physicians actually become attuned to it, then they begin to look for it as, oh, well, yeah, yeah, it isn't, okay, you have high cholesterol. I mean, the best, we have over and over the example of the patient who comes in, sees their physician, they have high cholesterol, they're put on a medication regime, they're put on an exercise regime, they're put on a diet regime, they come back in, they still have high cholesterol. And then they get accused of, you know, well, you're not following through. And says, no, 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 I'm actually doing everything I can, doctor. Well, obviously you're not, because look at your cholesterol levels. Now they're being attuned to the thinking. Maybe this is a patient who actually does have genetic high cholesterol, yeah, and we ought to, to do test more. Just put something into perspective and expand, I think it's important. <clears throat> All disease has a basis in genetics, right? Okay, so, but most diseases, we have a bunch of different genes, some of which we know about, some of which we don't, <clears throat> that contribute to developing the disease, and then we have a bunch of different genes, some of which we know about, some of which we don't, that protect us from the disease. So it's very hard to get a genetic understanding of most diseases. Mm -hmm. There are some diseases where a single gene causes the disease. Okay? And one of the typical examples that many of our attendees may have heard of is cystic fibrosis. We call that a monogenic disorder. One single gene in your body goes awry, you get the disease. Okay? So that's uncommon. And the condition that Duran is talking about, familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH, is a monogenic disease. One wrong gene, and you get a high LDL cholesterol from birth, and you get premature onset of heart disease. But I think it's very important that we realize that the vast majority of people in Canada who have high cholesterol don't yeah. have FH. FH, if anything, exists in maybe 1 in 250 to 1 in 300 adults in Canada. So the rest of the adults in Canada that have a high cholesterol, we can't blame a single gene. But to be honest now, Dr. Gupta, let me challenge you back. Is it okay to challenge him? Um, yeah, <laughs> no, we, yeah. Quick challenge. A quick challenge. A quick challenge. I mean, the, the challenge is that, though, the majority of those patients who do actually have that genetic predisposition are not identified. And I use my husband as, as my example, right? I mean, his father died at 45. High cholesterol, heart attack. He himself actually had high cholesterol. He's in the audience, so I'm not gonna look at him. Uh, and, uh, 
actually had bypass surgery by his mid-50s. His brother has high cholesterol. Nobody said anything about it. So about 80% of the people with FH are undiagnosed. We call it, you know, one of those majority diseases, which is not diagnosed. So you're right. Most people with high cholesterol do not have FH. On the other hand, most people with FH are not diagnosed. Okay. Um, so what are the other impacts on a patient's life and their family if they have high cholesterol? Well, I mean, speaking as a dietitian, I'm going to view that through my lens. But, uh, you know, I think the big debate point for anybody who's hearing that they might have high cholesterol, and, and more often than not, when you go to your doctor, you don't get that one immediate, you know, whether it's an assessment, a blood test, and they say you have to go on medication right <clears throat> away. More often than not, it's a discussion and it's an evolution over time. So you might hear, oh, you're, you're, you're borderline or it's trending upwards, or because of your age, or maybe your smoking status, or whatever, you're in a risk factor category that means we should really think about medication. And I think what where that that's where it starts to affect families and people on, a, on an individual basis, because they're often given a window, maybe say three months, to say, why don't you give some lifestyle yeah. changes a try, we'll come back and we'll retest and see where you are, and then that's where, where I come in, hopefully, and, and see if we can help that individual. I would imagine that also getting a timeline like that puts a lot of stress on people, which isn't necessarily that good for their heart. <laughs> you could you could certainly debate that point. The other way you could look at it is it helps people to sort of take ownership and maybe, you know, we all put things off, don't we? Making that appointment, going to see that person who's an expert in an area and finally saying, okay, enough's enough, time to focus. But we know behavior change works best when people are motivated from within as opposed to being sort of dragged in. So that's the trick is to say it's time and I'm ready. <laughs> And, and just to reinforce one of the points you made, I mean, <clears throat> anyone who has a chronic disease, like diabetes, like uh, high cholesterol, et cetera, uh, it's not just that individual who has to get engaged in changing their lifestyle, et cetera. It impacts the entire family. I mean, ideally, for lifestyle to be successful, it's not only the index patient or the, the patient that we're talking yeah, about. Maybe it's you the have entire to family. change what you serve for dinner. It's, it's, it, it change, you have the, the lifestyle, the, the whole ecosystem that they live in. Uh, to be ultimately successful because they need that more ongoing motivation and support and it probably wouldn't hurt the rest of the family either. So you know, It's also yeah. <clears throat> important to remember that you can't take high cholesterol in isolation yes. right? because there are other risk factors for heart disease or for stroke. And so just as an example, if you have a, an 18-year-old young healthy woman whose cholesterol is moderately high but she doesn't have a genetic disease, and she's otherwise healthy, we're not gonna to get too excited about her risk of having a heart attack anytime soon. She's 18, she's healthy, she has nothing else wrong with her except modest high cholesterol. But if this is a 60 year old man who smokes a pack a day, has high blood pressure, is overweight, has borderline diabetes, and has the same level of high cholesterol, all of a sudden now that becomes much more of an urgent nature to manage that because the risk for heart attack here is much higher. Which brings me to my next question, which is about diabetes and high cholesterol often going hand in hand. So why is that and what are the risks of that? Well, I think that's yeah, another doctor question. <laughs> Why don't I start in general? Well, I was going to jump in and talk about metabolic syndrome. So, oh, yes. so there's this sort of cluster of signs and symptoms a person may acquire over a period of time in their life. And, and it often starts with an elevated waistline. So, you know, we gain weight, typically a pound a year on average after the age of 30. And what you start to see is when you watch someone's blood work over those years, you see these trends and there's certain clusters of things you'll see. So you'll see, for example, um, something called your triglycerides, which are actually part of your cholesterol package, basically little pockets of fat in your bloodstream, start to drift northwards. Your blood sugar might start to drift northwards. Your blood pressure might start to also go up over time. And several decades ago, researchers realized that that's actually tends to come as almost a package. And the cholesterol tends to be going up at the same time. And they called that metabolic syndrome. And it basically means this individual is at an elevated risk for developing not only type two diabetes, but associated cardiovascular events. So you can see this very clearly, you know, when you watch a patient over years, and we've had that luxury where I work, is you can see the trends emerge. Now, just as nice is that you can also see those improve by making appropriate lifestyle changes. So it's not, you're not doomed when they start to go up, but that, that notion of cholesterol and diabetes going hand in hand is relevant. And on top of that, if you do develop diabetes, the standards 
for where we would medicate or start taking medications with cholesterol become much more strict. So someone with diabetes will almost automatically, and Dr. Gupta can speak to this, be prescribed some type of cholesterol-lowering medication. You know, th these are both diabetes and high cholesterol, and to much degree, the same degree, high blood pressure. These are unfortunately lifestyle diseases of living in a Western or urbanized environment. Okay? So just to put it into perspective, when we are infants, right at birth, our LDL cholesterol level, the bad stuff, is less than one. Okay? And we grow up into normal human beings with a very low bad cholesterol level. Um, the average bad cholesterol level in an adult in Canada is about three and a half. So something happens from when we're children to when we become adults. We go from under one to over three. But if you go to um, rural China, rural India, sub-Saharan Africa, where people are lean, they don't have access to the types of foods, obesity doesn't exist, they're healthy, their LDLs are one, one and a half. So in the, ex with the exception of the genetic disorders that Durain's talking about, for the majority of us in North America who have high cholesterol, it's partly related just to lifestyle. And the same with type 2 diabetes. There is some genetic predisposition for all of these things, but a lot of it is lifestyle. Uh, sp speaking of a genetic predisposition, I thought that um, East Indians uh, are particularly predisposed to heart disease. Is that correct? Yeah, sure. So South Asians, South which Asian, is... Um, yeah. Uh, I'm South Asian, right? Yeah. People from India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and South Asians are the largest uh, visible minority in Canada, okay? um, have amongst the highest rates of heart disease, diabetes, and stroke in the world. It's an actual epidemic. Um, without getting into a lot of detail, South Asians also tend to have slightly higher LDL levels, so that's bad, and slightly lower HDL levels, so that's also bad, so it's a double whammy. Um, and so in Canada, we recommend that South Asians actually be screened at a younger age for cholesterol and other risk factors than uh, other populations. Okay, so let's get to the point about managing this, managing your high cholesterol and if you have <clears throat> metabolic syndrome. So. I guess the first thing that your doctor will say is let's try to manage it with diet and exercise. What, it, what does that entail? Sure. Um, first thing is, I mean, no one should ever embark on any dietary change with the view that, unless they absolutely have to for, you know, there's real, I would argue, life and death, with the notion that I have to change everything today or else. Typically that will breed frustration, likelihood of failure will go up. Not only that, it's a burden to your family. So I'd much rather hit the things that are the easiest to change but have the biggest bang for their buck. Um, we're very fortunate that the University of Toronto has done magnificent research in this regard uh, on something they call the portfolio diet or the portfolio eating pattern and have demonstrated very well that adopting certain dietary traits or habits can reduce LDL cholesterol by up to about 30 to 40 percent um, just through dietary strategies and those are typically in, in clinical trials that have been maybe three months long. So with, with you know a very big impact from dietary changes. The trick is can you do all these things that they recommend? So this is where I say take the nuggets from this that you can and work towards it over time. The big factors are we want to increase what we call soluble fiber. Um, that's fibers from plants so it's, it's definitely going to be including more plant-based foods in our diet, but in particular, food sources of soluble fiber include things like oats, oatmeal, oat bran, that whole family of foods. Uh, fruits, particularly apples, pears, and berries. Um, we'll also find it in something called psyllium fiber, which you can find in some cereals, and you can actually buy it as actual husks um, at the bulk store. Barley. So the trend you'll see is whole grains in their intact form, not as white bread, unfortunately. Um, fruits. Vegetables aren't quite as high in soluble fibers, but they're generally included in these diets as well. And then we found particular cholesterol-lowering effects from other foods like olive oil. Uh, there's even been a, a trial on strawberries. Um, almonds, walnuts, pistachios have all been demonstrated to have cholesterol, exactly, all part of the good fat family, to have cholesterol-lowering effects. So adopting a diet that includes those foods will move you in the right direction. 
I would imagine that it's easier to include those foods than to exclude some of the bad stuff. You're, yeah, you're reading my mind. <laughs> it was very intentional. <laughs> like, start by giving people the good news and say, what can you include? Um, the question is, what do you exclude? And this is where there is controversy, without a doubt. The debate, if I was in this room a few years ago, I would have said, unilaterally, we have to cut out saturated fats. Those are those hard fats at room temperature, the butter, the coconut oil, uh, the fat around the red meat, and we, we said very clearly, those are harmful to our heart. What has happened in the last, starting around 2010, 2011, a series of papers came out that said, hold on a second, maybe we have been wrong about saturated fats influencing heart disease risk. It still remains controversial. What I can say is based on the best available evidence we have today, the suggestion is that it is a mistake to cut out saturated fats and replace them with refined carbohydrates. So what I mean by that is if you stop eating cheese but you eat 10 times as many crackers, you will probably be just as badly off in terms of your cholesterol and potentially worse. Uh, if you replace the saturated fats with what we call polyunsaturated fats, nuts, seeds, fish, then the effect on cholesterol seems to be favorable. So that's the trick. If you're gonna take something out, you can't put sugar in as a replacement. And, and what about um, processed food? Yeah, so that's exactly it. So this is now where we understand that these, what I call, I use the word refined carbohydrates. I mean those white flour-based processed foods with added sugars and certainly trans fats are, <clears throat> all have an effect not only on cholesterol, but on something we call inflammation which is part of the overall picture of the health of our arteries, which we can't forget either. So we want to keep those foods down and switch more to a whole foods diet gradually, over time. You can't do it overnight, but that idea of having you know, a, a lovely meal with some fish and some sweet potato and asparagus for dinner instead of the burger and fries, it won't change your cholesterol overnight, but over a lifetime it will have a very big impact. How do you deal with patients? I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people find this very hard. Most people find it very hard, right? I think as any change. <clears throat> One of the programs we introduced a good number of years ago now is patient self-management program, really working with patients to help them find their own motivation in terms of doing this, patients supporting each other. More importantly, a number of years ago, we introduced into Canada health coaching programs, which deliberately actually working with healthcare professionals, including dietitians, because when the doctor says you gotta do this, first thing the patient does, right, is to walk out the door and forget about it. <laughs> and when the dietitian says you gotta do this, this, and this, even somebody that does it very nicely, it's really very challenging, especially as you say, the whole family. One of the things we work with is what is it that really you want to do, why is it important to you, and can we start with what's the motivation? I remember we had a, a gentleman in there who had, had very high cholesterol, had high, high sugars, he was supposed to be running, he was supposed to be cutting down his what, fats, he was supposed to be cutting down his sugars, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you know, six months later, he was not doing anything, and he was also prescribed statins, was not taking any of it. And, you know, I mean, the question we always ask people is, what's important enough to you that you would make a change right now? And I remember he said to me at that point, he says, my kids, you know, and he said, okay, what do you want to do about it? And he started off with a regime that said he was going to walk for six minutes every day. And that was it. And that was all he could commit to. We thought that was pretty good. He walked the dog for six minutes every morning. Three months later, we saw him. He was now walking for an hour. We saw him six months later. He not only was walking for an hour a day, he changed his old diet, et cetera, et cetera. But it really starts with, what are you motivated to do? What's important to you? Because it's got to be important enough to you to make that difference. Not important to me, not important to your wife, not important to your kids. What's important to you? That's, and I think that's where you start, I agree right? completely. And I, I mean, I, I often will have clients leave an office, an appointment, and their goal will be to have an apple a day. And it may be as simple as that, because that is what's not only realistic for them, but it helps build their confidence. Now they know they've made a change, and they can make another change progressive change over time. I think one of the problems is that people don't cook, mm. don't know how to cook, because there are other ways to put flavor in things than putting a lot of... And one of the things, we had a mother, you know, busy single mother, you know, two, two young children, had, you know, tons of activities they were doing. We got her to, well, we didn't get her to, she actually, we said, what do you want to do, how do you want to change? Because she felt she needed to change for the kids. She herself had diabetes, was very severe. She says, I know it's bad because my kids are getting bad habits. They agreed that what they would do is that they would just, on weekends, weekends was the only time they would cook, they would shop, and they would do things together. Then they moved it to every other day during the week where the kids get to choose their own snack and they have healthy snacks. And again, 
and it was not every day. Three days a week, they do the fast food. Three days a week, they have soccer. They have you know, uh, dance classes. We get it, right? You can't do it every day. But if you can make some changes, it makes a big difference. You don't have to do it all. OK, so at what point would a patient be prescribed statins, which are the standard of care? It, that, it, that's a tough question to answer easily, uh, because it really depends on the patient and to some degree on the cholesterol level. So that might sound a little odd, but let's go back to that example I gave you. The 18-year-old young woman who's healthy, and let's say her LDL is over four. Okay, So that's high enough that we're not happy about it, but it's not high enough that we're worrying we're not in Duran's genetic world yet. Yeah. Okay, um, So we certainly would recommend diet and exercise and healthy lifestyle. And really, we wouldn't even consider statin therapy for her till she was much, much older, you know, till she was probably 40 or, or older. Um, that 60-year-old smoking, high blood pressure, overweight, uh, stressed out diabetic man, if he's four, um, we might say, look, give this your, you know, the good old college try for three months. But most of us would say, give it the good old college try, but we're getting you on to statin now. <laughs> okay. um, for the very reason that most patients, unfortunately, can't stick right, to the portfolio type diet for more than a few months. Uh, so it really depends on the risk level of the patient. The higher the risk of the patient, the earlier we're going to recommend medication on top of uh, ideal lifestyle. Uh, I remember seeing a quite controversial editorial in a very prestigious medical journal called The Lancet, which basically said every healthy adult over 50 should take a statin as a precaution. Nonsense? Uh, we're on air. Uh, <laughs> I'll be, uh, my, my personal opinion is actually I agree with that, but that's personal opinion. If we look at the science and we look at um, sort of uh, healthcare guidelines in Canada, we're, we're getting closer and closer to that. So this whole cholesterol story has really unfolded dramatically over about 20 years since statins came on the scene and we had the research that shows statins save lives. And over that 20 years, the threshold at which as physicians we recommend statin therapy has just progressively fallen. We're recommending it at lower and lower LDL levels earlier and earlier in life. But are we at the point where we can just have a blanket statement that if you're 50, here you go. Doesn't matter what your LDL is, no. Having said that, the most recent large statin study, which was actually a Canadian study led out of McMaster, my university, um, took uh, men over 50 and women over 60 who had nothing wrong with them. They didn't have heart disease or diabetes. They couldn't have high cholesterols. They simply had to have one risk factor. That could be high blood pressure. It could be obesity. It could be smoking. It could be just being sedentary. And as long as they had one risk factor, a statin reduced their risk of heart attack and stroke. So our newest guidelines that just came out a few months ago in Canada actually say that if you're a man over 50 or a woman over 60 and you've got one of those risk factors, you probably should be on a statin. Okay. I guess you can't argue with the Lancet. <laughs> Especially, I shouldn't. All right. Uh, I think there's an important, yeah. important point there that, you know, when statins were introduced in um, the late 80s, basically early 90s, and that what we, had, what we knew then in terms of what statins would do uh, was based on patients who had already had a heart attack, and then we would start the statins, and then we've moved it up gradually to the point where it's what we call primary prevention. Um, and, and, but it's taken that 20, 25 years to generate that data to show that not only are we lowering the cholesterol, which is we call a biomarker, so it's kind of we're, we're doing what we expect, but the real outcome that we want to achieve is preventing those heart attacks, preventing those strokes, and that takes a long time to collect those kinds of data. So it really reinforces the fact that we don't really understand medications fully, both in terms of their benefits and also their side effects, until we've been using for them for an extremely long time, especially with the long-term kinds of heart attack and, and stroke-based outcomes that we're looking at. So um, does this always control 
cholesterol, diet, and statins? Um, in, the, in the majority of cases, statin therapy, if used appropriately and in addition to a healthy lifestyle, can get most patients to target levels. Okay. Um, but there are going to be some patients who either can't tolerate the statin because although they're incredibly safe drugs, they do have some side effects. So there will be some patients who can't get to the right dose of and a statin. And the, the side effects can be uh, muscle pain, liver damage, right? Well, yeah, the most common side effect is muscle pain that is rarely, incredibly rarely ever dangerous, but it can be a nuisance. Liver damage is very rare, so I wouldn't even sort of worry okay. about that one. Um, or, especially if they have a genetic cholesterol right. problem where their LDL levels are very high. So remember I told you the average LDL is three and a half in Canada? Well, someone in Duran's world who has FH might have an LDL of eight or 10. Okay. And what's so, considered, Well, I, four is borderline bad or? Four is not good. Okay. Okay. And again, it's hard because it depends on the patient, right? But for the average person in this room, We'd like to, and assuming you don't have diabetes or heart disease, we'd like to see your LDL certainly under three and a half. You know, the lower the better, okay? but certainly in that range. Um, so if somebody starts very high, right, if they start at six or seven or eight, then even though statins are very potent, they only lower LDL by a maximum of about 40 to 50 percent. So you can see if you start at four and you get a good dose of a statin and you respond appropriately, we can get you down to two, 50%. Two is excellent. We're very happy with two, okay? But if you start at six and you can't tolerate the highest dose of a statin, maybe you'll only get down to four. Well, that's good. We've got you down, but there's still more work to do. And until recently, we didn't really have other effective drugs to add to statins to further lower cholesterol. So, you know, the majority of people will be able to get to target if they need a statin, if they get a good statin at a good dose. You know, one of the challenges, of course, is that because cholesterol is, high cholesterol is so pervasive, I think, uh, and statins are so very effective for many of them. I think, and in my world, you know, I also head up the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, so we're often working with people who are at the fringes in terms of what is ordinary. There are lots of people then that we don't actually focus on who don't tolerate the statins or who are taking the statins but they don't sufficiently lower their cholesterol. And sometimes it's genetic and sometimes it's for other reasons as well. And who, you know, are not able to get it down with exercise and diet. And I think, again, you know, having, I think as Dr. Gupta says, until recently not very many options. I think that was actually a real challenge. And then we also have, I mean, I just had a young mother, two young children, 29 years old. She had a cholesterol around eight and a half, you know? And, you know, she was on statins, didn't seem to be doing any good, and yet nobody seemed to want to talk to her about any options, right? We finally had her tested. She did have a genetic, one of her children has it. So I think sometimes having the high cholesterol, it is an indication of some other things and some other strategies that you might want to try. And certainly I think we're in a good time now where we actually have a lot more understanding and a lot more options. Okay, so there are some new drugs out there. Uh, well, the, the newer medications um, really are, in my mind, I'm, so I'm putting my payer hat on, in my mind, intended to be targeted to those patients who really, you've done your absolute best with the oral medications, with the statins, and there are a couple of other medications that can be tried, and you still have... Uh, uh, you know, LDL levels that put you at extreme risk. And a uh, um, couple of their, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna screw up the name. They're, they're, they're injectable products. So that's the PCSK9s, PCSK9s. So, um, and uh, a couple of them have been uh, brought to the Canadian market. Um, in Canada, we, especially when you look at uh, public drug plans, so the government drug plans, um, they require that new drugs uh, be evaluated by a national process. After Health Canada says they're safe enough to be on the Canadian market, they go through another process that asks the question of what, uh, how much additional value are we getting? For, so for the health, from the health system's perspective, are we getting good value from this new medication compared to what we're already paying for, which is basically the statins. 
And uh, so those two products have gone through that process. Um, they are now at, at a place where the, the price for these products is being negotiated. We have no transparency to that process. We just so, know that that's happening. So it, it is, so these drugs, because uh, they cost, I think you were saying $7,000 for a year's supply for, in give Canada. Give or take, give or take. They're yes. higher in the United States, I think $10,000. $10, yes, yes, so yes. right now, uh, they're, the they're provinces covered. are negotiating with, with companies um, for government drug plans, and there are some private drug plans that are making it available to the patients, but again, it's only after the patient has failed all attempts at optimizing you know, maximum statin doses and usually a couple of other medications trying to get the, the cholesterol down. So what are some of the other other medications? Sure, so yeah. uh, we have statins, and yeah. statins are our are, are go-to drug. Right? When you need course. a drug yeah. for cholesterol, you're going to go yeah. with a statin first. If the statin isn't enough or you can't tolerate it or whatever, we have a drug called ezetimibe. It's known as Ezetrol in Canada. And think of it as a weak statin. So statins lower LDL by about 40 to 50 percent. Uh, ezetimibe by 15 to 20 percent. So you get a little bit additional LDL lowering. And for some people, that's enough. Okay? There's another drug which is... Um, it's a, a drug that basically works in the gut by binding fat in your gut and not allowing you to absorb it. And it's sort of like azetamibe, again, about a 15% uh, reduction. But many of the patients we've been talking about need more LDL reduction than that, especially those who already have heart disease and their LDLs are still high, those with the genetic problems. And, and people who've already had a heart attack or... Yeah, that's what I was just saying, right? With yeah. heart disease. So... Oh. PCSK9 inhibitors are these new drugs. Uh, they are injectable. They, you basically self-inject into your thigh or your belly. They're, they're very like, easy. Like it's insulin. a pen. Like it's insulin. like insulin. It's actually okay. easier. It's a pen. You never see the needle. You just put it up against your skin and push a button, and it, it does the rest. And you give this to yourself once every two weeks. That's it. So it's not a daily thing like insulin. So it's twice a month. Um, in most cases, this is on top of statin therapy because statin wasn't enough. And these drugs lower LDL by another 50 to 70%. So they're really remarkable agents. And as cardiologists, we're incredibly excited about these drugs, particularly in people who've already had heart problems, strokes, or those with the genetic disorders. Uh, in fact, now, just recently, you know, the proof is in the pudding, right? So, um, Judy will tell us that Health Canada or payers generally won't pay for a drug, at least not in cardiology, unless it's shown to reduce heart attack. We know these drugs reduce cholesterol, okay? The studies to determine if they reduce heart attack are ongoing, and in fact, we just learned that the first such study is actually positive. So the drug tested in that study did reduce heart attack. The final details are going to be presented in a few weeks. So we're very excited about them. Okay. Um, I think the most important part of that, though, and I think it's what Judith said, and I think there's some misconceptions among some payers that, okay, we're going to make this available. Everybody's going to want to go from a 10 cent a day statin to a you know, $7,000 drug. And the answer, of course, is not. Number one, you don't really want to do an injection, no matter how painless, unless you have to. <laughs> Number two is that really you know, what we want to do is to be able to, as you say, identified those patients for whom nothing else has worked or who are totally intolerant to statins and then just focus on that small patient population. And then over time, as becomes more evident in terms of how well it works or as the drugs become cheaper, we might think about them for some of those other patients. Yeah. But I right now, we aren't talking about it for everybody. Though, these are not a replacement for statins. No, they may there. never it's, be. It's on top of These it. are for that small percentage of people who are at very high risk who are on a good dose of a statin, but their LDL is still too high, or they just haven't been able to tolerate a statin. Okay, uh, I think we should take some questions from the audience now. They've been uh, listening very carefully. Arlene. Okay. Hi. Um, I have a very high cholesterol, and I've been on about seven or eight different medications. I'm now seeing um, an endocrinologist, and he's monitoring me. I can't take the meds. I can't take statins. But I'm not good on any meds. I usually react. So 
I have a vitriol artery that's 100% blocked on the right side, and I need to do something. My dad died of a, a stroke at 64. My mom of a heart attack at 77. So I don't know if that's what you call FH because they didn't really go to doctors. So maybe if they did, it wouldn't. I don't know. So I just don't know what to do for me. So any um, ideas? Well, you're. I tried to eat the and yeah, you're in good hands if you're seeing an endocrinologist. Yeah. That's the the good news here because. <laughs> If, uh, if, if you do have FH, an endocrinologist or a cardiologist is the right person to help you diagnose that uh, and manage it and to determine if you might be a candidate for one of these newer agents that we're talking about. Okay, do we have an... Um, I understand that the president of the American College of Cardiology is actually a vegan. And I'm just wondering, uh, is he a nut, no pun intended, mm -hmm. Or is there something that's not quite publicly disclosed about the fact that animal source protein adds nothing to any known lipid parameter? I wonder if I'm distorted in that perception or if the panel agrees with that. Well, yeah, and I, there are some notable vegans out there. Um, there was a, sort of a big thing a few years ago when uh, Bill Clinton was was purportedly vegan and, and his physician uh, got a lot of attention for the diet that he placed uh, the, the president on. So that's, you know, I, I don't think the idea is that necessarily that one must be vegan to have a healthy heart. There are numerous diets, or now we call them dietary patterns. We've gotten away from the word just a diet, a diet implies short term. A dietary pattern is a series of habits that you have. And I think it's important to realize that there are probably five or six dietary patterns that have all demonstrated heart health benefits, be that cholesterol lowering, blood pressure lowering, helping to control weight, reducing risk of metabolic syndrome. Um, and those vary. They're actually, the extremes are, are quite amazing. That includes the vegan diet, the Mediterranean diet, which does include things like fish and olive oil and does include some cheeses in it. I mentioned the portfolio diet. Uh, and I mean, ruffling feathers here, but it is interesting to see that even something as crazy as the paleo diet has actually demonstrated some cholesterol lowering effects probably because people eat less on it and they lose weight, but also probably because they're eating a lot of fruits and vegetables. And I saw something that there was, a, there's a DASH diet, and then they yeah. tried another version of it with a little more fat, yep. and it was still fine. Yes, and so now the DASH diet, which is one of the best studied diets of them all, uh, Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, DASH, was studied as a diet to actually help control blood pressure. And then as it turns out, there were numerous other effects that were beneficial. And they've manipulated the DASH diet now to include not only blood pressure lowering um, foods, but also they've looked at its effect on the mind. Now there's a, a trial called the mind uh, diet, and they've, they, it seems like there's effects in the brain. We have to remember the whole body is interconnected, right? So if you make your heart healthier, your brain will probably get healthier. But the traits of these diets are all quite similar. And that is, they are very rich, very rich in fruits and vegetables. So a variation on DASH um, called the Omni Heart Diet had 11 servings of fruits and vegetables per day in it for a 2,000 calorie day diet. Now that's not 11 salads, but that means a half cup of a vegetable, cooked vegetable or chopped vegetable, or a cup of a leafy green would be one serving, and a serving of fruit about the size of my fist would be a serving. So 11 servings a day. And so the meat? The meat, palm of your hand, okay. <laughs> not a large amount. So it, it wasn't that we had to necessarily be vegan, but it's that we have to adopt this notion of eating lots of foods that come from the earth with minimal processing, and that's something that any one of those dietary sort of beliefs would agree on. Okay, we're going to go around the table just for some uh, conclusions, some final thoughts. Oh, final thoughts. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we haven't talked about, but I think we, we do need, need to make a point of, is the, the whole issue of compliance. If you do, whether it's dietary compliance or medication compliance. And, and we all always have to understand that it's extremely difficult, whether you have high cholesterol or diabetes or, or blood, high blood pressure, to be uh, compliant to those medications every day for the rest of your life, because that is what you need to do. And so um, one of the things that people need to, I think, ask their health professionals for, particularly pharmacists, just because I'm a pharmacist, is to get help 
with that, you know, help to be compliant to your medications and tools to be compliant to medications, to diet, etc. Because that's really, that's the trick, is sticking with it. And sticking with it with your, your, your food as well as with your medications. And, and if you feel better doesn't mean you should go off. Absolutely. And mm. that's, that's why people aren't compliant. Well, number one, I'm so happy we are talking about cholesterol because I think it's of those risk factors, the metabolic. Most of us know what good sugars are most of, and what good sugar level is. Most of us probably know what our good blood pressure is. I would wager most people have no idea what a good cholesterol level is. So I think it's really wonderful that we're talking about it. But I agree very much with Judith as well, is that we've got to involve the person. And I think involving the person, obviously, to take responsibility for not just the medications, but for their diet, for their health, et cetera, is really important. And giving that back to the, the person, but also involving the person so that if the person is coming in to see the physician or the dietitian, and the cholesterol isn't managed, that it isn't automatically assumed that you're a bad person, you aren't doing this right, obviously you're failing because I gave you all the right advice and I gave you all the right medicine. So if your cholesterol is still too high, it's got to be your fault. And I think we have a lot of patients that say that to us. I, feel, I don't even want to tell my doctor that it's bad, and I don't want to go see him because I know I'm just going to get blamed. So we need both sides of it. Make the patient responsible, but also do really engage and listen to that person. Dr. Gupta? Um, I guess for this audience, my key message would be, um, in a perfect world, nobody would need medication to control cholesterol, okay? And I'm sure uh, you'll speak a bit about the importance of lifestyle. But it's not a perfect world. So my key message is, if your physician uh, recommends a statin, okay, there's a lot of statin paranoia out there, right? If you Google statin, you're going to see that it causes cancer and it will get, you know, things growing out of your head and God knows what else. We know more about statins in medical research than we know about any other class of medication in history. We know more about the safety of statins than we know about penicillin or aspirin or insulin. And statins are incredibly safe. So my key message is, if your physician feels you should be on a statin, they're safe drugs, take them, and as Judy said, stay on them. Okay. Uh, I would part with food should be fun <laughs> <laughs> and, and do what you can that's reasonable within your life. We know that, as we've mentioned, Judy's mentioned it, compliance is the biggest obstacle in most research studies on dietary habits. People do very well for six weeks, six months even, but within two years, they drift back to their old habits. So finding one or two behaviors that you can stick with, be that using a breakfast cereal that has oat bran or psyllium fiber in it, or eating fruit instead of you know, having some crackers in the afternoon would be a tremendous change and one that I would applaud. And then in the bigger picture, as much as possible, if we can adopt a viewpoint that, that it's pleasurable to make food, that it's fun to be able to experiment or to eat with family, to eat socially, to have friends in our house. And, and as we get older, we tend to get isolated and food becomes a chore and a burden. And I think as much as possible, if we can start to take lessons from many of the countries that we all came from, where we all sat together and, and enjoyed food as a family, that social element can be just as important to longevity and good quality of life as any of the other you know, little knickknacks in any diet plan. Okay, that is all the time we have. I'd like to say thank you to the members of our panel. I think that was very informative. And also thank you to our audience. Thanks for coming, and that's a wrap.